That's how you know it's time for a freaking break. I actually think I'm acclimating pretty well, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> pretty damn productive today. Today I finished uh, the last of the cockpit seats. So all cockpit seating is complete with the exception of this one. This one doesn't have hinges yet, but that's only because I don't physically have hinges in Good morning, Friday, December 4th. Weather has reached a new low. It's, um, turn the radio down. The weather has really hit a new low today. Um, it's so wet outside, I'm just wearing my long johns, you know, because my jeans got so, so wet from just going to the marina office and back. I gotta get out of here. I can't do it. I've been here for four straight months, working on the boat every day. And although I've made progress, I'm not quite ready to go. I mean, we could go right now with what we have, but I probably have a couple more weeks to make her sea ready. But the weather is just so awful. You, know, we, you don't want to sail in this kind of weather. You know, you. Uh, and if I did get out of here and got to the continent, it's just going to get nothing but colder. So I'm going to make some kind of decision so I, soon because I can't live like this. I love living on a marina. I love the people here. I love living on a boat. I like all that. But the weather is like a, it's, it's like a prison that's holding me. Yeah, so today I woke up. It was minus two degrees. And it was raining and snowing at the same time. And wind is blowing pretty hard out of the north at the moment, which doesn't bode well. So it's supposed to be clocking around, but I, I, I will just have to see. Friday. December 4. I'm not even going outside. I don't think I'm going to go outside all day. Won't go outside? Yeah, that's what I thought. But shortly after those words were spoken, I saw this. A neighbor simply didn't secure his foresail and the winds just unfurled it. And if it was left like this, that sail would tear itself apart. So I had to go correct the issue in the driving rain and snow and of course I got soaked again. But it is a great example of the need, if you're going to leave your boat unattended, to prepare it. Obviously the worst thing that can happen to a boat left unattended is that it could sink or it could catch on fire and then sink right at the dock. You know, and I think that's pretty unlikely. <clears throat> we know that the boat's floating and it's not likely to sink. But I did have some tasks that I needed to do before I left. And one involves this tarpaulin. It's just an old sail of a dinghy, it's a dinghy sailboat. But I'd been using it as a tarpaulin to cover the cockpit seat job. And I needed to get it dried out and put away. <laughs> but that water was, was freezing rather than evaporating. Crazy.
like many other boaters, P.O. had a bunch of lines stuffed in a locker and they were actually wrapped up in cable ties. I wanted to clean and dry all the lines and I wanted to tie them properly in figure eight patterns. Figure eight patterns is something we'll talk about in a future episode. Um, it helps you deploy and use the lines. You, you don't coil in a circle. And I did that and I repeated 12 times. Not too bad. There's a sink, which is dirty right now. I'm going to clean it, and I'm going to clean the floor and the walls of the shower. And I'm not going to use the shower tonight. I'll use the marina bathroom tonight. But the question is, when you leave it, what are you going to do? You know, in this case, we're going to leave the dehumidifier right there, running just like it is now, except not at maximum sitting. You know, <clears throat> but when a dehumi dehumidifier is running, looking off the back, you can see a hose down there. Well, maybe you can't. So at the back of the dehumidifier, you know, is, is a hose which collects the condensation. So my my problem is that this condensation is dripping onto this wood frame that we stand on in the shower. And you can see it, at some point it's going to be all black and mildewy. Yeah, so about a week ago, I cleaned this area on the bottom, right, right by the drain, okay? Uh, this was all black and mildewy. So I did the usual bleachy stuff and I, I cleaned it. But I don't know that there's a way to actually correct that. That's just gonna be a, a cleaning job waiting for us when we get back. condensation on a boat well one thing you can do is go someplace where it's never cold because the outside air temperature is colder than what I want the inside of the boat to be right I want to heat the boat and I have a good heater and so because I've got a heater I'm able to stay warm and cozy and I can cook myself at night and that's great but warm air holds more moisture than cold air so it's going to be relatively more humid inside the boat than I want it. And whenever that warm, relatively humid air touches the skin of the boat, any of the metal fittings, condensation is going to form. And that condensation is going to be a lot. And it's going to drip at some point. Ideally, it would go directly to the bilge. But in this Yeah, so condensation, that's me nemesis. And you can imagine this happening throughout the inside of the boat, but whatever. I've got bilge pumps and it's time to move on. And after completing a few other jobs, the boat is ready to be left alone. Well, as ready as I can make it anyway. Look at us. Hey. Explain, what are you doing here? Well, in, in, in the micro sense, we're just waiting for food, okay? <laughs> in the macro sense, um, getting a sailboat ready to go and sail away. That's what we're doing. And you're waiting here for what kind of food? Oh, I'm waiting here for fish and chips. Fish and, fish and chips. Fish and chips, which is... Traditional Scottish? <clears throat> traditional Scottish style. I, and this is something that the first time I left the USA and traveled, it was to Scotland, actually, on a submarine that was over in Holy Lock. And I remember doing this exact same operation there. Where we would go and we would wait for fish and chips and we would have it served to us and wrap the newspaper and then we would carry it to a pub and that's where we would eat. Ah, very good. And I do remember that. Well, we're packed, kind of. I do theoretical packing. I lay out all the stuff that I think I want and then <clears throat> I look at the bag that I'm going to take and I have plenty of room for that. But I don't know if I can fit my hook. We're gonna see. We'll see what we can, we'll do a little test package right now. Well, everybody watching the channel has probably traveled at one time or another. So with my hasty packing completed, good or bad, I was off. Graham was kind enough to give me a lift to the Inverness airport and it was a quick flight down to London Gatwick. <clears throat> now in London Gatwick, you're required to walk through the duty-free shops every time. You, you can't get to your flight <laughs> without passing through the duty-free shops. 
this is sort of thing that makes me want to run away to a smaller place and get away from this commercialism. We're sitting here in the London Gatwick Airport. The restaurants are all closed. The pubs are all closed because we're in England, not Scotland. Scotland, the pubs have been open in the airport. And so was the, uh, the rest, so were the restaurants. Hmm. And here, it's, uh, it's like a train station. You don't know what gate you're going to have until uh, they, they announce it. So most train stations in England and in Europe, you know, they'll announce the platform at about you know, 15 minutes before the train leaves. And here, about one hour before the flight, they're going to announce the gate. So, so I'm sitting here in the open area and waiting to see. Oh, I waited like a good little passenger from my flight to Amsterdam. They announced the gate and I was off to gate 64, ready to board the plane. And then, got a bit of a surprise, a bit of a curveball handed to me. Alright, so here's intrepid traveler Russ here, kind of making up shit. Ah, the um... The situation is I'm not going to make it to Amsterdam because my I didn't have a connecting flight so therefore I would have been flying into Amsterdam and entering the country. That's what I can't do. What I failed to find in my research and I did try to find out exactly what the requirements were for entering Amsterdam and but we found out that when I was trying to board the flight to Amsterdam from London, Gatwick, that I couldn't get on the plane. That's the bottom line. So I'm going to bunk down here in London for the night. I can't get a nighttime train back to Inverness and I'm not quite ready yet to give up on my plan to go someplace hot. So here's a new plan. The new plan is to kind of treat London as I was going to treat Amsterdam, kind of spin the globe and see what direct flights I can get to a country that will accept Americans from London. And I might have to spend two nights in a hotel and spend all day tomorrow sorting this out. We'll see. Well, stuff happens. So I got myself down to a hotel and bunked down for the night and got busy thinking. And, I, and it's for sure one thing. I am not going back to Scotland to freeze. I needed some time away. So I thought, let's make the best use of our time and let's do a little looking around London. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. That's the best looking train station building in the planet. Stop. Yeah, and seeing this station just made me laugh. <laughs> so, I'm in a good mood here in London, and I decided to go visit the Queen at Buckingham Palace, but again, I was not allowed in. And then I decided to head to the one place in London I did want to see, and that was the Churchill War Rooms, deep underground, well, near Buckingham Palace, on the other end of Hyde Park. They even had a power plant, gentlemen and ladies, a power plant. That was so cool. And I got to learn what a muse is. Muse. Yeah, so the Royal Muse is part of Buckingham Palace in London, in which the royal family's horses, carriages, and automobiles are cared for and stored. I was not allowed in there either. So after a full day of touristing, back up in the King's Cross area, I pop into this cafe where the owner is a future sailor as well. I, got, I met a guy from Eritrea who put me onto this Polish beer, which is awesome. And I got to wander around the streets of uh, the, well, called the area around King's Cross. I technically don't know what the neighborhood's called. You know, and of course in King's Cross you see the homeless people, you see, you know, issues, you know, that display all that's wrong with the developed world. But I'll, I'm pretty darn pleased, you know, things are okay and I made my travel plans and I'm off to someplace new. So. The path to someplace new in London begins with the Piccadilly Line, which will bring a traveler directly to any of London Heathrow's terminals, and from there, I can get nearly anywhere.